Come on, keep your hands going this morning. Come on. Let's sing together. There's one thing I'm asking. One thing I need. The moment is passing. It's not what I see. Like it's the air I want your presence. Feet on the earth. Give up on me, you won't give up on me. Your love is 
up again with everything in us this morning. We sing, your love never fails. See, your love never fails. But if your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. So if your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out. Church, lift it up. You're never gonna. You're never gonna. You're never gonna let me down. It's not in your nature. You're never gonna. You're never gonna let me down, Lord. No. You're never gonna let. You're never gonna let me down. You're.
Cause you are good, always good, always good. To you are good, you're good. Before we move past this moment, I don't want you to miss an opportunity to really connect with the Spirit of God in this room. We've been singing out loud together. Now we're going to take a moment for you to just pause and reflect on just how good God has been in your life. This might be the first time you've done this all week. But I want you to close your eyes for just a moment. And I want you to focus on how good he's been. How his mercy has been renewed. How he's proven himself to be faithful. Come on, right where you are, just close your eyes. Think on the goodness of God in your life. We acknowledge you, Lord. Because you've been good. Where will we be without your love? Where will we be without your goodness? Thank you, Lord. So you're never going to let, you're never going to let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me. Come on, now that you've thought about it, let's just declare it. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let me. Down. Come on, let faith rise in this place this morning. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let. Come on, sing it again. You're never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, you're never gonna let. change our destiny. Our hearts are open and we're ready this morning to hear what your word has to speak to us in this season where we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. 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 You may be seated this morning. While you're being seated, can we welcome everyone watching online and the Hernando Correctional Facility as well? We're honored we get to be your church. If we haven't met yet, my name is Pastor Kyle. I serve here as one of the pastors at the chapel. And in this season, I'm hyped to be able to serve as the interim student pastor as well. Uh, this past Friday night was the element, which is for our middle and high school students. If your kids weren't there, just know you don't love them. <laughs> kidding, not kidding. <laughs> But it was incredible, uh, incredible Friday night just to see God touch the lives of students to be able to help them connect to him in the age and the time in which we live in. There's not a better sight to see. And so uh, I'm excited to be able to do that in this season. Hey, grab your worship guides. Grab your worship guides because in your worship guides there is some important information uh, about what's taking place at the chapel, how you can get connected, what's happening next. So you want to make sure that you engage there. And do know, Pastor Q, will be back with us next weekend. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, <clears throat> excuse me, this morning, um, I just want to take some time, and uh, at the very beginning, I, I just want to, I feel like we're family. Are we family? I feel like we're family. I just, even online, they're like, I don't know you, bro, but we're family. Cool. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I just want to talk about some things I'm going through right now. Can I, can I talk about, like, church is a good spot to talk about what you're going through, right? Somebody's like, this just got weird. <laughs> Uh, you ever have this thought in your mind or in your heart? I feel like everybody just wants something from me. Like every phone call that comes in, somebody's asking you for something. 
Like every time you turn around, somebody at work wants something, somebody in the neighborhood wants something, somebody in the community wants something. Like every time you turn, everybody just, 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 just wants something. Just, 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 oh my gosh, like you can feel the tension rise on the inside of your heart because it just feels like every time you turn around, somebody wants something. Somebody's like, hey, you're like, what? <laughs> I was like, oh, I just want to say hi. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Are you just expecting somebody just to, just to want something? Uh, I, <laughs> the other day, our mail lady stopped uh, Danielle and I, and she goes, hey, are you guys ever going to check your mailbox again? <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> every time I look at this, somebody what? Want something. <laughs> I was at Publix the other day. There's this little three, four foot, five individuals, uh, Girl Scouts, uh, they were selling cookies. They were like, sir, don't you want a box? And just so we're clear, I always want Girl Scout cookies. Is there anybody in here that knows what I'm talking about? Come on. But I like, I walked by, I was like, no, I'm good, I'm good. I don't want anything, I don't want anything. And then I came back out 20 minutes, like, here's, here's $15, give me two boxes and a tip, let's go. Like, like it's just, 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 just want something, just, just want something. Doesn't it feel... Like sometimes we carry the emotion of somebody always wanting something from our lives. Parents, can I get a good amen there? Doesn't it feel like we carry this emotion with us now into the relationship we have with God? Where sometimes we're so hesitant to engage God in relationship because we just feel like he's going to what? Want something. However, I want to challenge your perspective this morning, if I could be so bold, just to begin to see God not as somebody who wants something from you, but as someone who wants something for you. In, in, in painting it over that backdrop, it then leads to this scripture in Proverbs chapter 3, where God then makes the statement, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. It's like, PK, you just said he wants something for me, but he's asking for my heart. (laughs) And the reality is this, if we're all honest, don't look at anybody around you, but all of us in this room and watching online, we've got some trust issues. All right, y'all holy, I'm going to talk to y'all. Here we go. Like, 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 we've all got some trust issues, whether they're built in from the failures of someone else, whether they're relationship trust issues, whether just the fact that if, if you don't like a bacon, egg, and cheese McGriddle, I don't know if I can trust you. <laughs> like, if you can't rap the opening song to the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, I don't know if I can trust you. <laughs> I'm just going to keep it real, all right? Like we, we've all got a certain level of, of trust issues, and God says, hey, trust in me. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Understand, this portion of Scripture, this is the goal. This, this is God's, God's dream. This is hashtag God's plan, God's plan. For, for you to trust him with all of your heart. Now, he knows it's going to be a process for us to get to this point, but this is the goal. And so then God lays out for us in Scripture how we can get there. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and what? Lean not on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. My first point for today is ego is not your amigo. Uh, your, your, your ego is, it's, it's not your amigo. Amigo, Spanish, for best friend. Uh, 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 ego is, it's, it's just not your amigo. Let's, let's just all be honest and say that there is a way that we see our lives going in our mind and in our heart, and then sometimes our ego kicks in, which everybody just needs a little ego boost every now and then. Amen to that. But on the flip side, too much ego leads to arrogance, and arrogance is related to who? Pride. So in reality, ego, it's just, it's, it's just not our friend. But what is our friend is what Proverbs says, trusting in the Lord with all of our hearts, and what? Leaning not on our own understanding. 
There is a way that seems right to a man or a woman, Scripture says, but the end thereof leads to destruction, leads to death, leads to difficulty, leads to results that you were not accounting for. It's like, long story short, eighth grade, I thought I could give myself a haircut with my dad's clippers. (laughs) I think you can fill in the blanks of what took place from there, right? There is a way that seemed right to me. But the end thereof was a bad haircut. I walked in two weeks later, my barber was like, "Ah!" (laughs) leaning not to your own understanding because we only see based upon what our experience and maturity level allows. But God sees based upon the fact that he was there before the beginning began. He's been there every step in between and he's going to be there when the end comes as well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding Scripture says, and then in all of your ways, acknowledge him. Point number two for today is this. Our job is obedience. You should just look at somebody next to you, and if it's your spouse, you should look at them and just smile. Just tell them, you have one job. (laughs) Nobody did that. Y'all a little nervous in here this morning. I like it. I like it. So it's like, well, really, PK, I got dishes and a a yard to cut. I, I feel you. I feel you. But really, we have one job. And that one job is obedience, obedience to God's word, obedience to the, to the things that he asks us to do through his word. Because remember, God, God's not after something from us. God, God is after something, what, for us. Well, let me say it like this. Uh, Danielle and I, were raising a little girl right now, and she's two and a half years old. And uh, we're, we're at this spot where we're going through some things right now. Because did I mention she's two and a half years old? <laughs> you know, so, so every now and then, uh, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a strong proponent of not raising spoiled kids. <laughs> Thought I'd get a witness in this place. Hello. <laughs> and so every now and then, you know, she'll look at me with little brown eyes, a little smile, a little cute little voice. She's got these little hands and little fingers, and she'll sit down on the steps at our house, and she'll go, um, Daddy, come here. Come here, Daddy. Come here. Come here. Come here. Sit down. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a conversation. I'm like, well, of course. When somebody that cute asks you to talk, hello. Whoop, there I is. <laughs> we'll sit down. and You know, I understand like the first sentence that comes out. And then there's like 27 different subjects after that. And I'm just like, yeah, uh-huh, uh, yeah. And then, and then I pause the conversation uh, and I, I, I look for teachable moments because, you know, as, as a parent, you're always looking for moments where you just can plant a seed, train up a child what, in the way they should go. Don't mean they will, <laughs> but you're just going to train them up the way they should go. So the other day we were having a conversation because it's at this spot where it's just like the no's are a little bit more violent than they've ever been, you know? <laughs> at this spot where, you know, we've watched three episodes of Doc McStuffins and I turn it off and, ah! You're just like... Player, what is going down? <laughs> uh, we said, nah, I have a conversation. I go, hey, hey, Savannah. Yes. Savannah, you have one job. And your one job is to obey. She's like, <laughs> but I take ice cream. Hey, hey, you have one job. It's to obey. But I, 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 I. You have one job. When mom or dad speaks, you what? Obey. And I give like four instructions, and five minutes later, none of them have been carried out. <laughs> but then sometimes you pause and you go, doesn't that sound familiar? <laughs> no, really, doesn't that sound familiar? <laughs> like God speaks to us something on Sunday in worship or in a service like this. And we go, I'm ready for the week, God. Here I go. And then Tuesday shows up. <laughs> As old folk would say, you ain't done a nail, another thing with what you heard. <laughs> that means you haven't taken the next step. <laughs> I find in my own life, this would be a spot you know, the acknowledging him in all of my ways, o- obeying the word that he gave to take the next right step. I, I find in my own life that this is the spot where, where the struggle, hashtag the struggle, is real. 
And it's not that I don't obey God uh, all the time. It's just that sometimes I don't obey him consistently. Like, way to go, pastor. Follow me. (laughs) In moments of adversity, in moments of warfare, in moments of difficulty, in moments of of pain, in moments of financial uh, crisis, in moments where where Danielle and I just can't get on the same page, or or, or, or you you fill in the blanks or whatever. Like, those are the moments where I'm like, I'm all in. I mean, I'm locked and loaded. I'm focused. I'm lasered in. There's nothing swaying me to the right or to the left. Let's go. But when that moment ends... I find that I almost do one of these. I'm good. I'm good. I got this. I've been through some things. I got this. I was praying one day and God just kind of, you ever have a God nudge before? You know, it's different than when your spouse nudges you at church. That's not a God nudge. <laughs> but a little God nudge is just like, hey, hey, it's gentle, it's kind, but watch this, it's consistent. I usually know it's a God nudge when I'd like to ignore it, but it keeps on coming back over and over and over. God nudge me. He said, hey, I want you to understand one of the most underestimated characteristics of being a healthy believer and follower is consistent obedience. Like if we were talking in sports terms, we would celebrate a team that has an upset victory or a one-hit wonder that has a really good season, but the people who we really revere are the ones who are able to do these incredible feats over an extended period of time. God says, hey, You want to succeed in the stuff in your life that matters the most? Consistent obedience is the key. Not just turning it on when adversity shows up, but every day having a rhythm of connecting with me and more importantly, listening. There's a reason why, as I would tell my kid, God gave us two ears and one mouth. (laughs) to listen twice as close as we speak. So I go, all right, God, this is great, but how do you want to live this out in my life? And God goes, hey, this year I want you to read through the whole Bible. I'm like, okay. He's like, but I want you to switch it up. How so? I want you to actually listen to the Bible being read this year. Because let's just, let's just talk. It's just us. We're just talking here, right? We're just, we're just talking. Like Genesis has got some dope stories. And Exodus, there's some happening things. But you get to Numbers, <laughs> you know, and some days you'd be reading it. What happened was, <laughs> God says, hey, I, I want to sharpen your ability to hear those God nudges. I'm getting into numbers and into Leviticus, and I'm, I'm hearing stories that I've heard before in some cases, but with new ears, or I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm hearing some stories for the first time. And every time this takes place, it causes me to have this moment where my heart is just drawn even more to wanting to trust God. Because if Moses and the children of Israel could trust him in Exodus, and if he could do these great things for Abraham with just a simple walk on the beach, and if he could do these things for Jacob, and if he could do these things for Isaac, and if he could do these things for Joseph, and he's no respecter of a person, then I need you to do something for me as well. The key is that you and I walk out our one job, which is what? Obedience. It leads me to my my third point today. My third point is this. The outcome is God's responsibility. Our one job is obedience. God's responsibility is the outcome. I was talking with Pastor Jason recently. He made, made this statement. He said, uh, oftentimes, it's one simple act of obedience 
that leads to a supernatural result that only God could bring about. I found this story, and before we jump into this story, it's found in Luke chapter 5. Before we jump into it, I want to I paint a little bit of picture, give a little bit of context here. We're about to walk into a story where Jesus has finished the educational process that he needed to go through to become a rabbi, to become a teacher. And in doing so, uh, Jesus is now taking the next right step, which is to go out and to choose the disciples that he's going to commission to follow him. Back in that day and time, there was a phrase that they would use, the disciples would use in regards to their rabbi, it would be, oh, to have the dust of my rabbi covering my face. What they were meaning was to, it would be such an honor for each of them to be able to walk behind their rabbi. And back in that day and time, they didn't have asphalt and concrete like we've got today those streets were dusty. And so the dust that would be kicked up from the back of their teacher's shoes would then cover their face, and they thought it was an incredible honor to have that happen. So Jesus, having being one who completed the educational system, which it's not like you just complete one grade and graduate to the next, uh, like C's don't get degrees back, there, back in that day and time. Like you had to be the cream of the crop to go from one level to the next. Jesus being a rabbi shows us that he was the cream of the crop at every level of the educational system. Drop into our story. Luke chapter 5. Stepping into one of the boats, Jesus asked Simon, its owner, to push out into the water. Pause. Let's just say that Jesus has a way of stepping on a scene with a gangster lean, don't he? Because scripture says that Jesus didn't ask for permission to step in the boat. Jesus just went, hey, we cool? <laughs> like, you as the disciples, like, who mans is this? <laughs> I, like, Simon's like, what? Jesus just stepped in the boat. Said, hey, I need it. We good? Only good scripture says. So he sat in the boat and talked the crowds from there. When he had finished speaking, he gives another instruction to the owner of the boat, whose name is Simon. Now go out where it is deeper and let down your nets to catch some fish. Master, Simon replied, we worked hard all last night and didn't catch a thing. Let's just look at this for a second. Jesus, a rabbi, a teacher, son of a carpenter, steps into the boat of the owner of a, fisher, uh, of a fishery. The instruction he gives is that, hey man, or the, the question he asks, hey man, I'm here, we good? And Simon says yes. So Jesus continues teaching a crowd of people from a boat that's not his, and he looks at the owner of the fishery and starts giving him instructions. I don't know about you, but it's at that moment that I probably would have been like. Because, see, we know Jesus as what? Jesus, the risen Savior. Simon knows Jesus as a good teacher. But, see, what Simon gets a glimpse of is something powerful. Simon had the opportunity to go to the same schools that Jesus did. But the fact that Simon is now owning a fishery and running a fishery is proof that at some point his teachers looked at him and said, you are no longer qualified to continue and sent him home and relegated him to a relative social obscurity. You don't qualify. You're not good enough. But in the moment where a rabbi like Jesus is now going to select his disciples and he could have just stayed at the synagogue and chosen the best of the best, where does he go? Over to the local fishery and steps in the boat of a man named Simon. So automatically, Simon is caught off guard in this moment because he's like, one of these things is not like the other. But yet Jesus looks at him and says, hey, can we push out to the deep? Why? Because there are moments in our lives where God desires to give specific instruction and that instruction to you and I cannot be handled in the comfort zone where we currently are or around the crowd that we're currently with. This is why in some seasons it feels like relationships are just a little tenuous or why some of those friends that they have now become frenemies 
You know, sometimes folks will switch on you like Batman in the Batcave. God sometimes says, nope, it's time to push away from my comfort zone. Because there's something I want to show you that I can't show you in the shallow end. This is why sometimes in our relationship with God, there do come seasons where that five minutes that you gave him on your way in or those two prayers you prayed over breakfast and dinner, they just don't cut it anymore. And you feel this longing to push out from the shallow end into the deep. Stretching that five minutes to 15 going from being someone who maybe you just weren't generous with your finances at first but now you're feeling God ask you to take that next step and become a giver maybe you just weren't that intentional in the relationship with your spouse but now God is after you and said hey I need you to calendar a date with your spouse every week I, I, I don't know what the next right step is for you but we often say here at the chapel, it requires us to what? Lean in. Simon leans in and pushes the boat away into the deep. And Jesus gives an instruction. Hey, let down your nets. Remember, son of a carpenter, rabbi, talking to the owner of the fishery. And I love Simon because Simon's got a little gangster lean to him too. He says, we have worked what? All night and haven't caught a thing. Do you ever feel like that in your relationship with God? I'm taking the next right step, Lord, and I don't feel like I'm catching anything. But the next phrase that Simon lets out of his mouth begins the trajectory change for his destiny. He says, but if you say so, but if you, Jesus, say so. See, there's no reason for a rabbi and an owner of a fishery to be hanging out together. So there's got to be a reason why you showed up today. And it probably isn't coincidence that God is doing something on the inside of Simon's heart to prepare him for that moment in the same way that he's been working on our collective hearts to prepare us for a moment like this as well. And our response that could change the course not only of our lives, but someone else's life forever is, but if you say so. Just, 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 just give an instruction. Just, just, just give a word. Just, just tell me what, what the next thing is that you want me to do. Do, you, do. do I need, do I need to take, what's the next right step? Do I, do I need to schedule 15 minutes more to pray? Do I need, what do I need to do? And when God responds, Simon says, if you say so. This is where sometimes we get a little bit, a little bit cute in our relationship with God. We want Him to do these, these big, these big moments. Just like God, I'll trust you if you park the Red Sea again. I'll settle for the water over Fred Howard Park, Lord. I'll settle. I'll settle. God, I'll trust you if you. I'll, th- I'll trust you. And God says, nope. The outcome, that's up to me. But obedience, that's on you. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, leaning not to your own understanding, but in all of your ways, acknowledge him and watch as he directs what? Your paths. And understand that your path that he's directing, it's not just connected to you, but it's connected to everyone that's around you. Who's to say that your obedience to the instruction that God gives isn't going to be a moment where it's going to surprise those around you about what God does through you? Who's to say that that coworker that you are ready to lay hands on Their life isn't going to be dramatically shifted because of the obedient next step that you take in this season. Oh, the next step might just be to close your mouth. 
I'm going to go talk to this side now. Uh, uh, the, the next right step might be to start saying no to some good things so you have space to say yes to the best. The, the next right step might just be you getting onto the go team and starting to serve people that are trying to connect to God. And that selfishness you've been trying to shake off of you, it might just get shaken off when you start investing your life in the life of someone else. Because look at what scripture says. And this time, I know they worked all night, but after Jesus spoke, watch, and what? This time. Simon, I know you don't trust me yet, but if you put down your nets, and what? This time. Their nets were so full of fish that they began to tear. Let's finish the story here. <laughs> the next scripture. A shout for help brought their homies, this is how I read the Bible, in the other boat, and soon both boats were filled with fish and on the verge of sinking. And when Simon Peter realized what had happened, he fell to his knees before Jesus and said, Oh, Lord, please leave me. I'm such a sinful man. For he was awestruck by the number of fish that they had caught as they were as were the others who were with him. Peter's humbled and takes a posture of worship before the son of a carpenter who has become a rabbi and is looking for disciples. Why? Because Simon Peter saw that it was one simple act of obedience that led to a supernatural outcome. And the only one that could have done it was God. It's at that spot that I usually pause and I think about the homes that my parents both came from, broken homes, unhealthy marriages, simply just because they were not rooted in the foundation that is Jesus and led by the Holy Spirit through his word. My dad's 70 now, and I listen to him tell stories about things that they had to navigate through in their family. And it always causes my heart to be gripped with thankfulness. Because what he didn't have, I do. Because what he experienced, I don't have to. Because two people came together and said, God, we're going to trust in you with all of our hearts. We're going to make a ton of mistakes, but we're not going to lean on our own understanding. And in all of our ways, we're going to acknowledge you and let you be the one to direct our paths. Now, I do realize that in this room and watching online, that's not everybody's story. If it's not your story, can I encourage you that it can be just your simple next consistent steps of obedience that God will change your life and as a result, generations, your kids, your grandkids, your great grandkids and beyond will be able to share the story about how you saw God fill your net. and how he keeps filling theirs as well. So I don't know what the next right step is for you, but I do know this, that the, one of the blessings of obedience is knowing that you are not responsible for only what God can do. So just take the next step. In all your ways, acknowledge him. And he guarantees that he will direct your path. I want to pray for you this morning. Jesus, thank you so much. And in the same way that your word has been true for thousands of years, you are no respecter of person. And you are still doing great and mighty works today. Give us courage to follow your word. 
and strength to hold steady when things get a little funny. Tether us to your word and we thank you in advance for the outcomes that you will produce both now and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, there are prayer team members on both sides of the worship center, giving boxes in the rear and in the foyer. I love you. I hope you have an incredible week.